This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and for half a century, the legendary Southern rock band Leonard Skinner has captivated audiences worldwide with their unforgettable sound that celebrates the soul of America. Selling over 30 million records, their music has become ingrained into the fabric of American culture. And even though they faced incredible adversity, losing several members, including frontman Ronnie Van Sant, Leonard Skinner has persevered. Their indomitable spirit has driven them to continue sharing their gift of music, touring to sold-out crowds. Now they carry on their legacy into the spirits world with the launch of their own American whiskey, Hell House, a fitting testament to their southern roots and tenacious pursuit of the American dream. Carrying the torch for the band is Ronnie's younger brother, their lead singer, Johnny Van Zant. He joins us today to share the story behind Hell House Whiskey and what's ahead for this iconic band. Johnny, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you, Johnny. And so I want to start by talking about the magic of Sweet Home Alabama. So I'm a card-carrying liberal from the New York City area, born and raised in New Jersey, yet a song like Sweet Home Alabama resonates with me. Even though I don't know about all the stories that are told in the song, I don't know anything about it. But I do know that song really hits me deep in my soul. Can you explain that song and why it has this magic that's lasted for decades? You know, I don't know. It started out as a uh, as a joke, really, you know, about Neil Young being from Canada. What do you know about Alabama? So my brother Ronnie just... It, First of all, let me say that we love Neil Young's music, but, and the song, it says, you know, about Neil Young putting a Southern man down. And, uh, so it was kind of a joke thing and it just hit. And I think from the first don't, 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 it's a real easy lick. And I think kids that are learning how to play guitar, that's one of the first licks that they love to learn how to play. And the song is really, it just feels happy. You know, no matter what the words say, and uh, it's just a happy kind of song. And uh, you know what? To be honest, we were over in Finland years ago, and I was like, well, I wonder how Skinner, you know, because it was the first time that I'd ever been over there and uh, with the band years and years ago. And when, they, when, they, when the guys went into Sweet Home, I was just like, oh, my God, all these Finnish people know this song. It's amazing. You know, to think that a little old band from the west side of Jacksonville wrote that song and it's still going strong today. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I can't imagine that feeling because as an artist, when you travel internationally and you go to these countries that, you know, Finland's, I guess, a little more of a Western culture, but you'll go to some of these Eastern cultures where they probably don't speak a lick of English, yet they'll know every lyric to Sweet Old Alabama. Oh, that yeah. is going to blow your mind. Japan, and it really it freaked me out in Japan because... You know, we got to know some of the fans over there and uh, came to the hotel and hung out. And we were all like, hey, what are they about? You know, we're just as curious, you know. And uh, most of them couldn't speak English at that time, but they knew all the words. They could sing all the words to the song, which was unbelievable. That's amazing. Well, obviously, you're very good at music, but it sounds like you're terrible at retiring, Johnny. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I know there was like an announcement in 2018 that obviously the pandemic probably changed you know, things, but well. We caused so much grief for that. The, <laughs> the friggin' virus retired us for 15 months. And 2020 was going to be our last year, honestly. And for 15 months, we sat and watched the world go by and wondered what was going to happen after that. And we had obligations to finish out those dates that we had. And so we said, okay, when we're able to go back out and play, we'll finish that off. And, uh, we just missed it so much that it really was. Gary Rosington, of course, was alive during that time. And he was like, you know what? I've come to a conclusion. Musicians never retire. They just play less shows. And I think that's probably what we're going to be doing. <laughs> that's right. No, and I think the world wants that. Like, I, I feel like there was a time that, you know, I, I came up in radio like the late 90s and 2000s. And I remember there was a time where it was a punchline that the Rolling Stones were still touring. Because, oh, look at these old guys touring. And we're, and now people are like, we can't wait to see them. Like, when they come to town, they sell out every show. Yep. So what is it about the, like, guys like you, the Rolling Stones, that can just travel and play for decades and connect with people young and old? That's got to be bizarre, too, where you'll probably look in the audience and you see, like, a kid singing your songs. We have a song called Skinner Nation that we wrote about our 
fans years ago. And it, at that point, it was one of the lads was three generations bold. Now it's four. So, <laughs> and, and it really is, you know, I always say if you ride through the parking lot before the show, if it's an amphitheater or outdoor thing, they're out there playing cornhole, they're barbecuing. It's a family affair. And it really is. And I think the older fans have turned their kids on and their kids have turned their kids on. And, and uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. I think, you know, if I live to be an old man, I'll probably sit back on some porch smoking a cigar and drinking something and uh, maybe some Hell House whiskey. And sure. Yeah, we'll get into that. And, and it's, you know, it's funny. That reminds me of a story that John Bon Jovi told me years ago, because as you know, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, the hair bands were, you know, m mostly young females would come to the shows. And then they slowly realized the, these young female fans were turning older and they were bringing their daughters and creating another generation sure. of fans. When did you notice this, like three, like, like you said in, in the Skinner song, like these generations of fans? Was it, did it hit you right away or was it something slow? Like, wait a minute. No, no, no. It, was, it, was, it was a slow process for me. I, you know, whenever I joined the band, those established fans were already there. Actually, I was under scrutiny. I was like, okay, I, I just want to sing the songs, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. Because Skinner fans can be very tough folks. They, they have very high opinions. And uh, at that particular time, back in 86, 87, I was like, Man, okay, I, I don't want to piss any of them off because they love the band so much. It's more than just the music it's it is a nation it's a it's part of their lives and uh but over the years i started seeing kids we did a meet and greet and this kid came up to me and said wow you know i, I discovered skinner about six months ago and i was like really oh okay so he was asking me all about the history you know so i was trying to fill him in and uh at, at that point in time i went you know what there's a whole new generation coming into this thing Wow. And it really is. I mean, we'll do some of these country shows and kids, you know, that you think might just be in the country or totally in the Skinner. And then we'll go do a heavy metal show with Metallic and they're into it. So people from different uh, aspects of music that they like love this band. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. Well, I, I'm trying to put myself in a situation where you're explaining to a young kid the history of Leonard Skinner. Were we there for two and a half hours? Yeah. Like, oh, but I go. No, I, I got the. Short version. Oh, it's okay. Good, good. Yeah, that's a sick version. You mentioned about the South and 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 how you go from playing with country bands to playing with uh, heavy metal bands or hard rock bands, whatever you want to classify them. And it's funny because Leonard Skinner was one of those bands that always towed the line before there was a line because all of a sudden there became a thing where you were either a rock band or a country band. But you guys, and I think even the Eagles probably played in that space a little bit too, of playing to both sides of the spectrum. And now here you go, fast forward to the late 2000s, and you're seeing that these yeah. bands that are playing to both sides, the country and the and the rock and roll side. Yeah. Was that always kind of like the sort of the, the mysticism, the, the magic of Leonard Skinner, where you just weren't you weren't put in a bucket when the band came out? You know, my brother and the guys in the band, I mean, very proud to be from the South. But they said, oh, it's a Southern rock band. And they were always under the opinion that, hey, they love blues, country, rock and roll, and all of it. And it was all mixed into Skinner. So that tag of just being a Southern rock band kind of bothered them in the beginning. Uh, and then, of course, after it kind of grew, you know, they went, oh, okay, well, I guess maybe that's what, that's what you want to call us. We're from the South. Do it. You know, yeah, but, uh, you buy our album, go to our shows. You could, who cares yeah. what kind of thing <laughs> we are? And, and I want one more thing about Skinner here is the fact that in August, the band marked a 50th anniversary of their debut album. 50 years. And I know you weren't there since the beginning, but can you put into words like for a band to be around and relevant for 50 years? Yeah, you know, I was around. I was a kid, but I was around. And I can remember that pronounced coming out. And we had an old, from a store called Montgomery Wards, so it was like an old Victoria kind of radio that sat on the floor. And uh, had speakers, you know, and you lift the top. And I can remember putting that record on and going, wow, this is so cool. But I don't think at that time anybody in the band or anybody around the band thought, well, okay, 50 years from now, I'm going to be talking to you about this band. You know, so it's a pretty amazing thing. My brother was just a genius at writing lyrics that touch people. And he had a great band and great bunch of guys 
that, that were with him. And they just had that magical thing at that time. And it just hit. Uh, it really hit. And what was so ironic was that Pronounce came out and it did very well. It gave them an opportunity to make the second record. <laughs> and uh, then they came out with Second Helping with Sweet Home Alabama on it. And it hit. And people went back and went, oh, my God, the song Freebird on Pronounce, you know. And that, so all of a sudden they had two really big records that were it was a pretty amazing thing and being around it, you know, and seeing it happen. That's awesome. When did the free bird become a punchline at like every, every, at every live show, people would scream to whatever band was playing? It was Van Morrison at one time said, if he hears somebody holler in his audience, free bird again, he's going to go crazy, you know? So uh, it just started happening, you know, and. It was pretty funny. I went to a share concert one time with my wife, and I actually got the yell free bird in the audience. All right. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. All right. And to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Leonard Skinner's debut, you are now in the whiskey business. Hell House by Leonard Skinner. Let's start with whiskey. Yeah. I'm assuming you like it. Well, you know what? Yeah, th- it's it's really good. It's 90 proof, so I want to tell people, drink responsible. I had to do a little internet thing and I kept asking to do it and take a shot of it a few nights ago. And about, about a fourth or fifth shot, I was pretty, uh, getting hammered. So it's very good, but we, you know what, we had talked about getting into the business because we used to be connoisseurs of that years ago. So we talked about it years ago and just the opportunity never happened. And it came along to us from be spoken and, uh, we got together, we started doing tasting, testing, you know, trying to figure out what we really wanted. And I think we came up with a good thing, you know, I, I really do. I think our, our fans are going to love it. And I think people that like to have a nip and tuck, I call it a nip and tuck every yeah. once in a while, uh, uh, you know, it'll be a good thing. And in terms of that taste profile, because I know this is sort of like the complex part of it. You talk about the testing and the tasting. I mean... You had a lot of responsibility here, Johnny, because you had to come up with a whiskey that tasted like Leonard Skinner. And I know that sounds weird, but I'm sure you were probably feeling like that, too. It's like this has to t- like when people drink this, they have to be like, yes, Leonard Skinner. To, to me, it's a it's it's a, a good reference. I think, you know what? Uh, some people like a little harder shot of whiskey and some people like a little smooth. You know, some people like a little sweet, and I think it has all those combinations. I really do. And it's funny, too, because you came from, you're coming from the world of music, which can have a bit of uh, bureaucracy and politics. And you've probably learned when it comes to the spirits world, there's a lot of that as well when it comes to getting this stuff on the shelves. How eye opening has this entrepreneurial experience been to you? Where, like, oh, so I can't just come up with a whiskey and it goes on shelves. There's more yeah, to it than that. So it's it. It's a, it's a difficult thing. You know, each state has their own regulations. And just like I live in Florida, it's taken us a little time to get the licensing and everything to go through here in Florida. But I hear in September, we're going to be on the shelves in Florida. So I think the best way to get it right now is through the internet. And uh, it's an amazing feat. It's not, not as simple as you just said it. It's yeah. not as simple as, uh, okay, I'm just going to make this and put it out. In. Yeah. And so uh, the, to, to talk about the name Hell House, this wasn't just a random name that you chose for the whiskey. But well, there's, there's, yeah, there's probably about that. For that. The guys, whenever they wrote all these songs, Sweet Home Alabama, for one, was written at a, they had a practice house here in Green Coast Springs, Florida, which is not too far from me today. And uh, on the water, and it was just a little shack, and there was no air conditioning, no heat, no toilet. And they wrote all these great songs out of that place. And it, and they called Hell House. So mm-hmm. we went through all these names, you know, because we went back and thought of songs, you know, Still Unbroken, Give Me Three Steps, you know, whatever whiskey, you know. Nothing really fit. And then I don't even know who said, hey, how about Hell House? And I went, you know what? I could see a guy sitting at the bar and going, give me a shop Hell House, you know. It's a perfect name, Johnny, because... It's one of those things where I always feel like icky when a when a band or someone comes up with something and they'll just call it like Beatles rum or like yeah, and I'm sure you felt that too. And Hell House is one of those things where it resonates because I'm sure the diehard 
Leonard Skinner fans know exactly what that means. So, and then obviously everyone else gets educated on it, but at least there is some significance to the name that works with Leonard Skinner. Sure. Yeah. You know, we didn't want it to sound phony or goofy or, and we said, you know what? Hell House, perfect. We should have came up with that in the first place. And so talk to me about the family dynamic, because I know Leonard Skinner has basically been a family run business for all yeah. these years. Can you give me some behind the scenes? This is a you know business podcast. What's it been like running a, a family business in the world of music and now in spirits? Like to me, I have a brother, and I couldn't imagine going into business or, whatever, or touring with my brother. To me, that's there's it, it seems so foreign to me. How does it work? If you know the family, then you know that we've had our ups and downs yeah. over the years. And uh, since Gary passed, we've actually went. You know what? We need to be closer time is short and uh we've actually come together better now than ever of running things and being on the same track and i look forward to the future seeing what happens and, and you know what it's 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 an amazing thing it's it's uh I always say the music of leonard skinner is bigger than all of us well we're long gone somebody's going to be loving this music and Till then, we're going to try to run the family business the best we can. Johnny, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, like, too many cooks in the kitchen. Like, how many cooks are in the Leonard Skinner kitchen right now? Like, about obviously, four. it's you. There's four. <laughs> There's four. And how did the four of you come together when it came to whiskey? Was was it everyone on board from the, from the jump? You know what? Everybody thought it was a great idea. We all thought, you know what? Because, again, we've been thinking about it for years and just didn't have the right placement or the people to work with. And uh, this came along to us, and between management and all of us, we put it together and very proud of what we've accomplished so far. We hope that it uh, continues, and uh, we'll see what the future brings. Cool. Now, let's talk about the current state of the music industry. And sure. so much has changed. We don't need to explain it to everyone how much it has changed. But for someone who's been on the ground experiencing it, What's that change been like to you? Is it almost like just adapt or die, just keep keeping up with the Joneses? Like, how do you fit in this musical landscape of 2023? Well, I think for us, the band's already established, so that helps out there. I couldn't imagine being a new artist right now, you know, because records, you know, whenever we started and whenever I started, we sold records and, you know, I get these, I still get paid for BMG, paper you know saying what i was paid for and they come in you know, a big stack like this and it's about you know nine grand and i go wow 20 something years ago if i'd have got that that'd have been 90 grand you know so i just can't imagine starting out right now i know we have like the voice and all that kind of stuff but i think uh even that i don't even know if that's great for artists because i think you have to get out there and you have to do your you know, work hard and get your chops like, like in the old days. And then all of a sudden you go from that and the real world and it's not Hollywood and it's a lot tougher for them, but you know, record labels have 360 deals that they do where they go, Hey, I want your publishing. I want part of your publishing. I want some of your live performances, your merch, you know, stuff like that these days. And I just, uh, you know, they have to be out on the road to make money. You know, they can't make money off of, uh, not unless you're doing, not unless you're very, very successful. Making money off of music is just not something uh, recording wise. It's more of a, of a, you know, trying to just get yourself out there these days. Yeah, it's funny you said that. You, 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 you were just reading my mind because the one thing that has not changed in terms of the music industry is the touring part of it. Yet that is your bread and butter. Obviously, with Larry Skidder, it is your bread and butter right now. Um, and I, I think I read that. People were saying that Taylor Swift was hoping to become like the first billion dollar tour ever, which I'm sure as a musician, that's got to seem like like yeah. crazy numbers out there. Um, but you said earlier, you're going to tour it until you get to can't tour no more. How profitable without getting into like your your billing statements, how profitable is touring for you guys today? Like if it does the math work at the end of the day with the, the amount of cost of traveling and all well, that? I'll let you know at the end of this year. <laughs> goes everything this in the past what two years everything's gone up fuel you know uh now they have a regulation for bus drivers that you can't drive more than 10 hours so you have to stop or bring in a oh. driver so everything is just 
And you know what? It sucks because who who pays the price for that? The consumer, you know, the people coming to the shows. You know, I can remember going to shows for six dollars fifty cents or even less. You know, now you couldn't even get near the parking lot, and it just it just keeps going up and up and up. So, I mean, when you're running five, six trucks and trailers and buses and crew, it's very expensive to tour. It really is. And for the for the younger ones, I mean, you see them out there with trailers and pulling trailers, buying buses and doing most of it themselves. And they have to do that to be able to make some sort of living. And they have to play multiple shows every week. When you ask me that, I'm very serious whenever I say, I'll tell you at the end of the year, you know, you <laughs> see all that comes in at the end of the year, but everything has gotten so expensive. It really has in the last few years. Uh, all right. So let's wrap things up because, with legacy, because we talked about the fact that, you know, you've got the whiskey, you got the band still touring until you guys drop. Are there more Van Zants coming out of the woodwork that are going to be part of this band going forward and continuing to tour? Yeah. Like we mentioned the family business. Are there more of you guys? No, uh, I'm the last of the wild ones there, man. So uh, there was three of us and, and uh, our family, Ronnie and Donnie and myself. I don't foresee that. I have girls, so I don't think they're going to sing uh, Leonard Skinner's song. You know? <laughs> you know what? The future's bright, and we'll see what the heck happens on down the road. You know, we uh, right now we're getting through today and get through twenty twenty three. We're out with ZZ Top. Man, it's been so successful. And again, getting back to the consumers, all these shows that are out for me personally. Sometimes the fans blame the band, you know, oh, the band's charging too much. Man. No, we don't have anything to do with that. You know, we come in, we get a guarantee. And if it sells enough tickets, we may get some commission on the back end. But most of the time it's, it's where it's at and the promoter and what the charges are going to be. And it's not our fault, folks. Don't blame the artists. I, oh, yeah, well, let me, this reminds me because, uh, you know, there's this phrase called like Hollywood math where you'll hear about a movie make. Eight hundred million dollars into the studio, be like, yeah, we didn't make any money on this movie. Uh, how has that improved? Is there more transparency from the band's financial side that you're able to see? Okay, cool. X number of tickets sold. We make this amount of money. Is it more transparent than it used to be? Because I know in the dark old days of rock and roll, where people well, were just taking advantage of these artists. Are you are you guys safe? Most bands, if they're professional and you're playing amphitheaters or working with Live Nation or whatever, have your own accountant out on the mm -hmm. road that are doing that kind of things and going through the receipts, what was spent and what wasn't spent, you know? And and uh, so hopefully the bands are, are doing that. So yeah, it is more transparent. You can't you can ask what, what the deal is these days. Awesome, I love it. It's Johnny Van Sant. Thank you for telling me more about the Hell House and your story and everything that's going on with the band. So thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, brother. God bless. Bye-bye. And that'll do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you could spare a moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review so more exceptional folks like yourself can discover the show. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.